hurt his head, the bow hung in his head. He was cool. Welcome to the Strange Brew Podcast. My name is Jason Barnard, and that was 10cc Rubber Bullets live at Nebworth 1976. And that's because I've got Harvey Lisberg here today. Hi. He's got a wonderful autobiography out. I'm into something good. My life, managing 10cc, Herman's Hermits, and indeed it is many more groups that has Harvey has managed over the last 60 years or so. And um, great way of, of going into the show because your book starts by a pivotal moment live at Nebworth for 10CC was 10CC's final concert as a four piece. Yeah. A concert, a huge scale given that they were supporting the Stones, but necessarily the crowd weren't 10CC fans. Loads of delays and whatever. So it's a real insight into how you're dealing with that and the emotions that you go through as a manager? Yeah, it was a very interesting day and evening, to say the least. To start with, 10CC, I don't think, ever opened for anybody as an opening act. We missed out so many opportunities, like an Eagles tour in America when the album was in the charts, which would have blown us wide open in America, territory that we didn't get. However, Nebworth phoned me up and they said look we're doing the stones and uh, would you open and I said I don't think we're the right audience for that really quite honestly we're a fantastic opening up for anybody because they're brilliant musicians and they will do an irresponsible set but really they were going to see Mick Jagger go on the toilet it didn't matter they weren't going to see you know we're going to see 10 cc so out of the audience i reckon maybe 100 99 percent would have been the stones and maybe one percent went to see 10 cc who hadn't really they were big but they hadn't really accumulated tremendous power at that stage anyhow we got there i was in france in the morning on holiday with my wife for a month flew into a luton airport my the driver picked me up within those days we were living the life of riley he picked me up with a new car and we went to Nebworth. And when I got there, there was a kind of an atmosphere. We breezed past Jack Nicholson, Paul McCartney, and a few other unknowns. 
And <laughs> it was a hundred thousand people, and it was like a beautiful summer's day, and the done our equipment in or something to that effect. Now Eric is the perfectionist. If a slightest thing is wrong, and I thought, oh, it's just Eric being Eric, you know, they'll sort it out. But it wasn't. He was actually telling the truth. In in all concerts where there's an opening act, the main act has control of the board. So ultimately, they do have control, and they can do what they like. I'm not suggesting they did, yeah. but they have got the power to do it. Uh, all 10CC knew is we can't go, and we can't hear ourselves in the back. And we, we're doing four-part harmonies. How are we going to do it? And so I spoke to Fred Bannister. I got him in. And now the point is that we were offered £27,000. I don't know what that is worth today, but it was the equivalent of doing a whole tour in England with no expenses, walk in, walk out, Kevin Law didn't want to do it anyhow, I'm pretty sure. Then the money seduced everything else. I mean, it was totally illogical not to do it in a way. So now we're stuck there and we can't go on stage. So that creates a problem. And the delay went from five to six to seven. And why can't they fix it? Why won't they fix it? And um, finally, I said to Fred Bannister, look, I've got an idea. Why don't you just pay us the money and we won't go on? The crowd are not going to wait till 11 o'clock to see Mick Jagger. They'll be waiting for five hours. They won't, they won't ask for the money back because nobody's gone to see 10cc. It's so logical. And Fat Bannister wouldn't bloody do it. No, you've got to go on and do it. And I only worked out a week ago my theory of what really happened. I do think that possibly the Rolling Stones had interfered with the sound equipment, and they'd done it intentionally because I think they had a problem with Keith Richards, who'd had too much to drink or something, was sleeping it off in the uh, house there, I think. And that makes sense because, well, maybe Fred Bannister knew all along, no, they've got to go on because the stones aren't going to go. I don't know. It's very weird. Now, the other advantage to us was we had a very intricate lighting set, which at 5 o'clock might as well have been in the toilet. You wouldn't have seen it. So um, at nine o'clock, now all the dark, it's getting dark and it's beautiful lighting. And these lights are really good. Done by a guy called Francis Coates. Anyhow, they open up with One Night in Paris. <laughs> and I, I, I just, I just uh, no, it's bad enough you've got to win these people over. But to start with One Night in Paris, really, you know, this is real self-destruction. Anyhow, they struggle through... They had to reduce the set as well, which didn't bother me, but it, they reduced it from an hour and a half to 50 minutes or an hour. And they started with that, and they struggled and struggled and struggled. The crowd weren't rude or anything. Yeah. It's just that it didn't feel right. It wasn't right. They weren't in the right place. Anyhow, they finished it. I think, I think Mick Jagger went on about 12, I don't know, 11.30 or 12 o'clock. Went down very well because obviously the crowd had gone to see him, but his crowd were totally out of it by now. Whether it was drugs or rock or booze or whatever it was, they've been drinking and drugging for five and a half hours waiting for him, and they've had this distraction of one night in Paris and they're set by ten six feet where they've got the buggers off in their socks. <laughs> and that was Nebworth. And I went back to the hotel. I missed the plane back because I was going to fly back to France in the evening. Everything was done. And that was the end, and that was the last time the four members played together. What a way to go out. And apparently Keith Richards smashed his car on the way home. Gosh. Yeah. He had a Bentley. And the driver. So he had a, a very good day altogether. And by then you'd had a, about 14 or 15 years in uh, music management. And it's a really interesting um, way that you combined your talents. You were sparked off with your love of the Beatles, a bit of a songwriter as well. But importantly, your background in accountancy and how you managed to talent spot <laughs> Herman's Hermits almost straight away is remarkable. Well, it's either total luck or a bit of foresight. And I was conned anyhow because the group had all the family in the, in the audience when I saw them for the first time near Davy Hume in a youth club. And so every time they finished, I saw her standing there or... Johnny Be Good or whatever, they're almost rushed off the stage by all these kids. And I thought I walked into the National Lottery. Apart from the fact I love the look of Peter. Peter had a great look anyhow. It was, and it was clean cut. It was, that was interesting as well. 
it wasn't the Beatles with the long hair that their mothers wouldn't want, or the Rolling Stones, who they would commit suicide if their daughter brought home. It was a clean-cut, Cliff Richard type, clean-looking, Catholic, blue-eyed boy, and he had a protruding tooth, which was very peculiar. It was probably luck. Right. Everybody hated Herman Hermits. Uh, I worked them, once I got them, I worked them seven nights a week. Sometimes we did trebles. Two o'clock, five o'clock, and one o'clock in the morning at Shorrocks Club in Queens Road. In it, and we finished there, and we were rolling in money. You know, we're pulling in. You know, we did. We had no mortgages, no Ferraris in the garage, no houses to pay off, no wives to pay for, no children, nothing. All we had was we worked, and we had all this money, and it was enough for young kids. And that's and it, and it grew. The grassroots following followed. Meanwhile, all my friends were saying, you're joking, aren't you? <laughs> you know what I mean? And I was doing my article clock to the accountancy, so it wasn't, the thing hadn't evolved yet. My idea was to get the songs I'd written right. to somebody, first of all, by starting to get it to a well-known artist. That totally failed. That's probably because the songs weren't good enough, okay? And then I said, all right, well, I'll get my own band. So I got a thing with the Manchester Evening News, a talent contest thing, and that's where it was that night. And that was the first time I'd ever seen anything like that. It was uh, it was a stroke of luck. It seemed so quick with I'm in something good. Herman's Hermits over here were right into the top of the charts. Yeah, what happened was um, in those days, so I got the band now, the next thing is to get a recording contract because that's the most important thing in those days. If you had a, it's like a, it was a pedigree, you had a record. Oh, Wayne Fontana's the Fontana, you know, Hollies are with the MI, this one, that everybody had. And so the main thing was to get a recording contract. And I was at the Plaza Ballroom with one of the lunchtime dates, the owner Herman Sermits. And I went in the office of um, Terry Devine, who was the manager, and I saw a letter from EMI on the desk. It was written by somebody called Derek Everett. And I said, do you mind if I borrow that? He said, yeah, no problem. So I borrowed the letter. And I wrote to this Derek Everett, said, we've heard all about you, Manchester. You know, really, would it be possible for me to come and meet you with a view to getting a group, group of recording? And he said, yeah, sure, come down. So I went down there, I walked through the door. And the first thing he said to me, is, by the way, Harvey, he said, I have nothing to do with artists in repertoire. All I do is I put records physically in dance halls for EMI. So at that stage, he subsequently became managing director of MCA Records and was a huge person in the record industry, Derek Everett. But in those days, it, he said, but there's a kid on the block called Mickey Most. He's just done a record called House of the Rising Sun, which I had heard. And I thought, well, yeah, he's good. I'll, I'll go and meet him. So I went round, he arranged the meeting, went to see him. I took a little postcard of the band to show him. And I said, would you give us a recording contract? And then he sort of shrugged. He said, yeah, they look quite good. Anyhow, I kept phoning the office. Nothing happened. He didn't move, nothing. So I had a brainwave. I'll send him two air tickets plus a hotel in the Midland overnight and get them to go and see Peter Noon, who was working at the Beachcomber in Bolton. So he came up. He followed that. He came up. We took him there. And I had a crummy little Triumph Herald, which was my mother's, which is a beaten out old car, which was just pathetic. But I'd invested in one of the first record players ever to go in a car, which is a Phillips record player, which used to play 45s on the suspension. So when you went over a bump, it still carried playing these 45s. Anyhow, he sees the group. He says, they're quite nice. Yeah, they're quite nice. And um, he goes back to the hotel with me. And outside the Midland Hotel, he says, well, I've got a track it you might like. I'll see what you think of this. And he played um, into something good. And I just, I just collapsed. I thought, that's the greatest thing I've ever heard. It was just a hit. Hit, hit, hit. There was, that was my talent, by the way. Apart from songwriting, I learned how to pick hits. And because of my musical background, that worked. He said, but there's one thing, Harvey, you've got to get rid of two members of the group. So I thought, great, he's come up here. He's he's bought a record. So give me the golden cap and I'll go and get rid of two members of the group, which was pretty awful, really, because they'd helped everything in the group. They weren't great. And the joke was that Mickey didn't really use the group members that much afterwards. And the the, the group, then the people who replaced, one of them was really very strong looking. And it, it was a... It was awkward, you know. Anyhow, we went back to Peter's house, met his parents. They'd agreed to sign with me. The funny thing was, I started playing on the piano in Peter's house. Alan Rigley, one of the guys that was kicked out, was there. I started playing the piano, doing Tell Me What I Say by Ray Charles. 
And Peter said, would you like to join the group? I said, no, I've not come here to join the group. I've come here to bloody get my songs done and everything. So that they said, okay. Then we told Alan that he was not going to be in the group because Mickey Mouse wouldn't give us a recording contract. And Peter and I, and he left, stormed out of the room. And then I went in the van with Peter to go somewhere afterwards. And he's lying in the middle of the road, right? And Dave, you wrote. So I'm driving this van. And I had to swerve to miss him, who's lying in the road there. And I had a terrible vision of him coming up behind me, like in the next two weeks with a knife, because his father was in jail for some capital crime. Alan Wrigley was serious, looked heavy. He wasn't really, but he looked ferocious. So that was what I was dealing with. Then it had all fizzled out. We got different members of the band, and we finally evolved into the Hermits Hermits that you know. We went down to the studio, they did the record, came in the charts at 27, 27 to 13 to 8 to 3 to 1. Knocked off by Pretty Women, bastard. <laughs> Roy Orbison, who was great. I love Roy Orbison. did you spot the talent of Graham Goldman when he was in the whirlwinds but you also knew how to work with him in terms of getting a, a song and you knew when that was a hit like for your love yeah we finally got together and when we did sign and he decided to pack in the whirlwinds and pack in everything and concentrate on writing we used to go on every day from like 10 till 5 to his house and try and come up with ideas for songs for instance the first thing we did was for your love which was I said, and I said, why don't you do something on the chords of House of the Rising Sun? And Graham, being a genius at the guitar, surreptitiously changed the last chord, which just slightly changed it, and then came up with his song, and then we decided, well, we'll break the rhythm, we'll make it completely different. And his father was a, a frustrated playwright, very talented, and he helped with a lot of the lyrics. And Graham, when you say Herman's Hermit, yes, okay, that might have been luck, but I knew all along Graham was a brilliant guitarist, played in this band called The Whirlwinds, which was like the equivalent of a Jewish-Irish show band. They played all the... Originally, the bands that were Jewish bands, they revolutionised one thing, were all bands that played dance music. So at the bar mitzvahs and the weddings, you've got 
the old foxtrot and everything. But whoa, was actually young kids that actually played the guitar. They were very young and they were very good. And Graham was outstanding. Well, I think Graham was outstanding anyhow. But was that period in 1965 where you had a, a load of Kennedy Street management artists? Yeah, well, once Herman started to happen, I bought all the partners out in Kennedy Street and went in full-time partnership with Danny Batesh. And it was a good partnership from 1965 to 1996. And we developed a lot of things and it, there were good times. And at one stage in 65, we had the top three in the billboard charts. But Wayne Fontana, again with love, Freddie... I think it might have been, I'm telling you now, and uh, Herman Simmons. And that was a terrific achievement. seemed to be a few years before that combination of Graham Goldman and Herman's Hermits in terms of persuading Mickey Most that it would be a good fit, some of Graham's songs. Oh, no. We submitted For Your Love, it was rejected. We submitted Bus Stop, it was rejected. Subsequently, which I would have rejected possibly myself, was a Tim Rice and Lloyd Webber song because they came to me and I put them on a management development deal. And they had the song that Jason Donovan had a number one with, and that was rejected as well. So and Mickey rejected so much, they did a film. And in the film, there's a track called Listen People, which Graham had written. Just a beautiful little song, which Graham did. And, and they went to America, and it was recorded, not by Mickey Mouse. It was just, and it got to number two in America. So that really helped. It's confidence level, yeah. But I think the penny dropped somewhere, somehow. And he thought, right, okay, we're going to use this kit. And from then on, they used No Milk Today, East West, four tracks from the film that Graham did, you know, lots of, that they did was Mrs. Brown, You've Got a Lovely Daughter, the four tracks in that. Graham was just, uh, and then Graham did songs for everybody, you know, obviously Pamela, Pamela, that was probably rejected as well. I don't know, I can't remember. <laughs> but the thing I want to tell all people that are going into the entertainment business, I was a manager, as an artist. If you can't deal with rejection, you better not go in that business. The art is to get rejected and pick yourself up and say, to hell with it. And that's what happened with Herman Sermitz. All my friends were telling him, what a load of rubbish. Then they had number one record. Oh, it's a one-hit wonder. The next record bombed. 
I know, oh, well, it's all over, isn't it? And after about 10 hits, they stopped talking to me like that. They changed their mind. Around 1967, you've got that incredible moment where you've got such a, cl- a, a different range of styles. You've got The Who supporting Herman's Hermits in the States, but they got on really well, didn't they, those two groups? <laughs> we're not talking musical here, are we? We're talking, we were no. on tour together, and it was a wild, wild situation. After each night, um, The Hermits and myself used to play cards with a game called Bragg which was that we used to start after we finished, and we were sitting in 2.30 in the morning in the hotel room in, in Montgomery, Alabama, and I got a telephone call, just give you an example. And, and the manager of the hotel said, Mr. Lisburg? Yeah, yeah, it's me. This is the manager of the Holy Holiday Inn from Birmingham, Alabama. I said, yes, can I help you? <laughs> he says, well, in Mr. Moon's room, there is no toilet. <laughs> so I said, what? So what do you mean there's no toilet? He said, well, the toilet's not attached to the wall anymore. <laughs> Keith Moon had dropped a million cherry bombs down this toilet, dislodged the thing out of the wall, and that's the sort of thing that went on. Whenever we were in the bus, they were dropping these cherry bombs on the motorway, and they're like glorified bangers going on all, all over the place. Then he's spraying everybody with that bloody stuff that you have to get out of the way. I don't know what it is. It's like, like shaving cream, but I don't know what it is, over everywhere. I mean, he was a total maniac, but a fabulous show drummer, fantastic show drummer. And I think Carl always wanted to be in The Who, Carl Green, when he saw The Who, and they, they, they were just excited them. They were an exciting band, The Who. And, and it was great, you know, it was, and it, was, it worked out well. Although they were totally wrong for each other, it worked out well because The Who went on with the right idea, well, we're going to get exposure here and we're going to, build an audience and they did that really helped break them we broke by going on the dick clark caravan of tours 
which was about 15 different acts from Bobby V, Del Shannon, Martha and the Vandellas, you just name it. And, and then we were on it. And then when we had about three hits in the top 10, we were like supporting the whole tour because we were getting nothing, the same as everybody else per night. So we might have been on a grand a night, but so was the opening act possibly. And so we had three records in the top 20 and that's why we moved in there to an agent. And then we got our own things going. By 1967, what was it like working with Mickey Mouse into getting the band either involved in the studio or songwriting? Because this busy line from the album Blaze, which I think you wrote with some members of the group, but was there a bit of a clash there? Uh, Mickey just wasn't interested in the band's development musically. Derek Leckenby was a fine guitarist. Keith Hotwood and Carl were great musicians and they just didn't have a chance. I mean, they could only get on B-sides and album tracks. And I think... You couldn't really argue with Mickey because he had a fantastic talent of picking tracks or songs which are obscure. Silhouettes was out of the blue, you know, a fantastic, wonderful world, which was published by Alan Klein, who was Mickey's manager. But (laughs) we don't don't really, you don't know how they ever got to them. I, I always suspected, well, maybe because he couldn't ask me for a rate because I was like the manager of the band, possibly, that that probably might have been a dissuading factor. Although I think Mickey Mouse talent in developing artists was tremendous. Hot Chocolate were tremendous from nowhere. And the great songwriters, Mickey had a good ear. He had a good ego as well, but that's okay. And he didn't encourage the, the hermits. That's my only regret. Because I think if the, with a minimum of encouragement, they'd have at least been able to develop their own musical potential with that potential, with having the threats. Because Mickey, the band always thought, oh, we always favour Peter but Peter was the focal point that's what the press wanted to discuss they weren't interested in the guitarists they were interested in the lead image but the band and so this was weighed on by Mickey most as well because he could get to Peter and say oh this is a great song that's not a great song you know and um, it was the same with Wayne Fontana and the Mindbenders Freddie and the Dreamers every act I was involved with I think there was tremendous resentment from the members of the band with the leader who was the focal point which is it's a shame, but, you know, in other cases, though, they, they, they were allowed to do their own music, where in this case, they were kind of restricted badly. I hear you say anytime. You 
again, spotting talent. When uh, Lol Cream and Kevin Godley were art students and, and songwriters, you spotted their talent as well. The songs were fantastic. It was, I mean, it, they were amazing. I had good ears. I loved music. And they were great songwriters. They really were. And what I saw in Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd Webber, I don't know, but I saw something. Everybody, the band were telling me they're a load of shit. You know, what are you dealing with that for? Come on, Harvey, come on. What are you dealing with that for? But, you know, I, I, I just knew it. I mean, Tony Christie was a planned thing, obviously, because I wanted I wanted to expand yeah. Kennedy Street. So I wanted a Tom jones type singer. I wanted to go into comedy, which was all locked up by somebody called Hughes in Liverpool. You can stand on your head. You're not going to get into that scene. I wanted to do classical music. That was held up by Gabay or Gabay or Gabay, whatever it is. Control all the all the things. So we couldn't get, you can't get a sniff. It's all monopoly everywhere, all the way down the line. And then I got into sport. And that was the same sort of thing because I'm out in publishing. That was another thing. Those are areas I want to expand and expand and expand. And I wanted to put the company to be a public company to sell out, make a bloody fortune. And Bob's your uncle, thank you very much. Unfortunately, my partner, Danny, did not have the same opinion. He liked going into the office at nine to five, doing the same thing every day, watching his love team, Manchester City, get slaughtered at the weekend for 30 years until now. But, you know, Danny was happy and he didn't want to have to be responsible for doing accounts. And, and he wanted the freedom of not having to have people look over his shoulder, which I can understand. But it stopped you making any money as far as real money is concerned. And everybody else went public. Mam went public, yeah. Tom Jones's people, the grades, everybody went public. I mean, all the promoters sold out, all that. It, it was all that sort of thing. But I don't think Danny was interested in it because he was quite happy. And the great thing we both did was we put Manchester on the map. We had a recording studio, Strawberry. We had, we weren't going to London to go to any more bloody recording sessions. We were going to stay in Manchester. I wasn't going to live in New York because they had 10 hits. No, I was going to stay in Manchester with a crummy little office on top of a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> Subsequently, we moved to Altrincham to a nice one. But, you know, that's how it was. Godly and Cream. That Frab Joy in the Runspool Spoon, that album has finally come out. Well, my favourite song of theirs is one called Samson. It's just a beautiful song that they did. And, of course, they did Consequences as well. <laughs> we get to that maybe later. But, um, yeah, Frab Joy and Runspool Spoon was just that George Ogomolsky, who I was really close to then, because I'd done For Your Love, Heart Full of Soul, Evil Heart of You, all Graham songs with Georgia. And I said, well, can I manage Julie Driscoll? Because you're having no success with her. So he said, yeah, all right, let's try it. So I got hold of Julie Driscoll, who never worked one day in three years. The price kept going up and up. And the final coup de grace, we got um, a phone call from New York saying that Revlon would like to do an ad work with Julie Driscoll we will pay $250,000, send you two first-class tickets over. You will need, will need her for three hours. Julie didn't believe in advertising makeup at that stage, having used it originally. So when that fell through, that was the end of my dealings with Julie Driscoll. God bless her. She's a wonderful singer, great artist. I think I saw her perform once in the three years. Gosh. It's amazing. And she's so talented. What about the setup of Strawberry Studios then? That was through Kennedy Street. Uh, Rick Dixon, who worked for Kennedy Street, was a co-managed Eric, then co-managed 10CC with me. And he looked after that side of things. They constructed the studio and, and Kennedy Street put money into the studio. And it was a very big success because lots of bands in Manchester didn't want to go to London. It was beautiful. It just worked perfectly. And Eric was tremendous. Eric was a terrific engineer. He also got it all together. Graham invested in it. So it was like a cottage industry. It was a cottage industry. The range of uh, music that was recorded there is remarkable. Astounding. I mean, right through to, I mean, right through to the punk era as well. All the other bands that came out of it in the 80s, never mind me. There was all the or original stuff. And Neil Sadaka went there. Well, Neil Sadaka was really be. Yes, Neil Sadaka went there as a result of me getting Amarillo to Tony Christie. It's a long way round, but yeah. I was in New York and I loved Neil Sadaka from early years, my teenage years. Sweet 16, Breaking Over the Heart, Calendar Girl, all those sorts of things. And uh, I was in Donny Kirshner's office in the Brill Building in New York. And I said, what have happened to Neil Sadaka, who nobody had heard of? And Donny, oh, he's, up, he's upstairs. 
do you want to go and see him? And I said to my wife, Carol, yes, yeah, sure, we'll go and see him. And uh, I've got this new singer, Tony Christie. He's like a Tom Jones type thing. I'm looking for material for him. Then we'll go and we'll listen to these songs. Well, Neil played four very ordinary songs, and then he played Amarillo. And I thought, that's like another I'm into something good, hearing something. And I just think, I couldn't believe it. So that's amazing. And Neil Sadaka looked at Danny Kirshner, and Danny Kirshner, and think, is this guy stupid or what? I mean, because they didn't like it. They genuinely didn't like the song. Anyhow, I get back home, my wife Carol saying, get a demo, get the demo, get the demo. And it took me three, at least three months to get Donny Kirsch to send me a demo. I got the next train down to London. I saw Mitch Murray and Peter Gallagher. They were in the studio the next day with Tony Christie. Then it wasn't a big hit. And it wasn't even a hit in America, which was a joke. But uh, I mean, that's another story. But it became a hit again when Peter Kay did it on the video. And it was the biggest record of 2004. There you go. Neil Sedaka, the songs that he subsequently did, including like Solitaire, amazing. Correct. Well, what happened is Neil Sedaka got the success of Amarillo. Oh, there's something going on there. You know, let's go and sniff it out. So I said to Danny, well, why doesn't he come over and try some tracks with us? Originally, we were just going to do it a few tracks. He then did the album. And it was a beautiful album. Kevin Lowell and... Graham and Eric were magnificent on it. Magnificent. We used to go there, first of all, and Neil Sadako does his little concert, gets on the piano, starts playing Happy Birthday, Sweet Sixteens, and, and everybody's sitting around it, and everybody's clapping, you know, and it's like a, a little entertainment show for everybody. Let me get on with the work. And on Sundays, I used to take bagels and smoked salmon because he loved it. And the, and the so-and-so credited me on the album, not as anything, but Bagels and Lux, Harvey Lisp. <laughs> on the first album and then he came to my house and there's so many funny things happened with him it was incredible one final story which is just hysterical he came to my house so in a little office I've got two boys who are now 11 and 6 or something or something like that they're sitting on a city Neil Sadak is sitting on a city and I put the demo of the album the Trolla days are over the song and in the middle of it Neil starts crying and really crying and getting a handkerchief. My kids are paralytic. Carol manages to get them outside the room before there's a complete emotion. And I'm watching it and he finishes the song and he's finished those crying. And he looked at me and said, did I write that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it was a beautiful song. And it was very sad because it was the story of how he was finished writing with Howie Greenfield. It was quite... T- and then they, that, Neil Sadaka is Neil Sadaka. He's a very talented musician. Yesterday is yesterday, the past is dead and gone. 
It seemed a natural genesis for what became 10cc to form and, and release records. Yeah, well, they did that album. They did the Ramesses album as well with some very spectacular tracks on. Super album. And it made me Neil even said, why do you record yourself? Why do you do it yourself? And then they, they went on to do it themselves. And they, they did a couple of tracks and they all love this track for Waterfall which I personally didn't like. Well, it wasn't that I didn't like it. I didn't see it as the I'm into something good or Amarillo. I just thought it's a very pleasant track. But Eric and Graham were convinced it was the bee's knees and they got it to Apple. And Apple gave them a bit of a run around on it. And Jonathan King knew, knew me, obviously, and he, he knew Eric and he came up to the studio and they played him Donna. And he said, that's a hit. And we both laughed. Everybody laughed. You know, you, you are joking, of course. Well, £500 as it isn't or something, you know what I mean, or whatever. And he got the advance and that was it. We signed with Jonathan King on a ridiculous deal, um, low royalty rate. But I knew it was a bit lower. I wasn't, I thought it was more important to get the record out than getting a huge royalty rate. And that turned out to be true. The, the downside was when we came to leaving him, he was totally obstructive. I never wanted to leave Jonathan King particularly, but he wouldn't change the rule to it. So he was getting more than each member of the band, which didn't seem to make sense.
But when you did leave Jonathan King, certainly in the States, because the lack of success in, in the States in the first period of Tennessee was, was not right. Yeah. My suspicion is that Jonathan King had some connection with the head of DECA. I don't know whether it was a father's friend or whether it was a family or what. He wouldn't move from London Records. Now, it's just crazy that he wouldn't want to for his own purpose. He wasn't stupid. And at the end of the day, we actually moved to a company where we knew the company wasn't that good in America either. Mercury Records was pretty awful. Just that they offered so much money that you had to weigh it up. And at the end of the day, you know, your hindsight, you can't, you never know what's right. But I don't think you can gamble with your future. If somebody offers each member of the band in those days, like 200 or 250,000 pound each, guaranteed, you'd think about that before saying, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go with somebody else because they're more arty or something. Did you get that feeling when you heard I'm Not In Love that that was going to be a... Oh, my God. I had about 10 seconds of that. Oh, my God. It was astonishing. We went into the studio. They put it on. And then when this is a different ballpark now. This is like, whoa, it's MacArthur Park. It's whatever it is. It's, it's on its own. The only thing is, could you sell it? Because it was long. You know, there were little, little things like that. And uh, no, I, I had 20 seconds, I'd say. And I thought that was the greatest thing since last breath. Even though I love a lot of the other stuff, the other stuff, I liked a lot of Kevin Lowell's longer stuff. Your One Night in Paris, How Dare You. I mean, they were magnificent tracks. I mean, they were solid. You know what I mean? They were just works of art. Um, but I, I, I'm Not In Love was, it, it had everything. It's, it's a standout song for me. And when 10cc was a duo, do you think that Eric's car crash in, was it 1979, was a turning point and, and things weren't quite the same after that? No, because I think the turning point was when Kevin Lowell left. Right. I think there was so much tension and so much, it just created a very sour atmosphere, an atmosphere where Graham and Eric had to deliver. And it's not easy. You've lost two brilliant people. But the brilliant people were terribly uncommercial. They were commercial, so it was like a fusion in the studio, probably like a boxing match. And I think at the end, Kevin got fed up of being told, nothing it produced this way, and they just wanted their freedom. They weren't interested in anything but freedom. I think that's when it really started. I don't think Eric's crush was terrible. Yeah. And I don't know whether it affected the dynamic, because they'd already had the hit, The Things We Do For Love, which ironically was bigger than anything else other than I'm Not In Love in America. And it wasn't as good. You know, it was a nice song, but it didn't really compare to a lot of the earlier 10cc stuff, in my opinion. But commerciality is important. P. 
continued managing graham and graham continued to have some fantastic songs with wax uh bridge to your heart being an example oh what a talent andrew gold was absolutely brilliant and a lovely person and a real naughty man a real a real mischief maker we were in hawaii with him my wife carol myself and two of my friends and andrew came with his friend at the time debbie and uh, we're having a meal. And uh, when it came to ordering the wine, I said, oh, Andrew likes a good glass of wine, don't you, Andrew? And he said, yeah. So Mickey said, OK, well, Andrew, you pick a wine, take your pick, you know. And then when the bill came to the end of the, the meal, Mickey decides he's going to take the bill, right? And Andrew taps me on the shoulder. He says, Harvey, he said, yeah, I've been a very naughty boy. I said, what have you done? He says, the, each bottle of wine we had, and we had three of them or something, with $250 each a bottle. So my friend gets this bill, and to his credit, he doesn't pass an alley, just give the jet. And I thought, you bastard, Andrew, you carved us up here. But as far as music was concerned, he can play every instrument. He could write the original stuff he wrote with Graham, Common Knowledge, got some beautiful tracks on it. Wax is terribly underdeveloped, which I'm working on now. I think that material 
is underexploited and has got a future, definitely. And I did try to buy Andrew's catalogue because he, he was selling it at the time. Uh, I was a great believer. Thank you for being a friend. It's definitely a classic. And so is Lonely Boy. Ah. But his mother was Marnie Nixon. And his father was Theo Gould, who wrote Exodus. So he's got a reasonable pedigree and a wonderful voice. And what a tragedy, he dies at 59. And he and Graham got on like clockwork. They really did. And that's why the quality of the music was so good. And the final thing that destroyed Wax was Andrew's fear of flying. So when we do a date in Germany, he's going 24 hours on trains to get there. And you can't do that. It's not reality. Well, there's so much more that we haven't covered and we don't have time for. <laughs> the, the snooker, the other acts that you've worked with, but that's the reason why people should get I'm into something good. My Life Managing 10cc, Herman's Hermits and many more. What a pleasure it is to speak to you, Harvey. It's been brilliant. It's lovely talking to you. And thanks a lot for doing this. I appreciate it. Fantastic. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye. Nice talking to you. Bye.
Thank you for listening to the Strange Brew podcast. If you do like the show, please consider a small donation to help keep the show archive online. It's 10 years since I started the podcast and hosting fees are increasing over time. All your support keeps the show running and helps me get amazing guests. To support me, just go to thestrangebrew.co.uk where you'll see a donate button on the homepage. Thank you very much. Plus, any reviews on your podcast services help to spread the word too. Thank you.